Wages for the under 30s have been decimated since the financial crisis and are still 10% below their 2010 level. Home ownership in many parts of the country is out of reach of the millions whose parents are unable to help with a deposit. And social housing now is a distant memory in many areas. And the insecurity of private renting means upheaval and uncertainty for a majority. How did this come about? How can it be, with all the productive and creative advances of the last few decades, that in some of the most important aspects of life, my grandchildren have a less secure life to look forward to than mine? John Maynard Keynes famously predicted in the 1930s that these expanding capacities would lead to a 15-hour working week and the rest of the time filled with leisure activities rather than worrying about how to find more money. For today's young people, more than any other generation since, his dream could not seem further from coming true. The good society that I think most of us envisage is one that's free, democratic, prosperous, environmentally sustainable, safe and secure, based upon the values of fairness, equality and social justice, where everybody has the ability to develop their talents and enjoyment of life to the full. Austerity provides us with none of this. None of this suffering is necessary. Austerity, as I argued in September and have continued to argue since, is a straight political choice. There's no economic necessity behind it. There's a broad consensus from the IMF and across the economic profession against it now. It's time to change the rules of the game. Neoliberalism, the current rule book, has outlived its time. The old rules are failing the majority and they will not cope with the changes that are ahead of us. My real concern is for the long-term well-being of our economy. If we're to thrive as an economy, we have to base our future on the rapidly developing new technologies. Labour and government will bring business, unions, scientists, universities together in a new innovation policy strategy with a mission-led goal to boost research and development spending and maximise the social and economic benefits from that expenditure. Our major corporations, despite record profits, are sitting on vast cash piles. At least £400 billion pounds now is held in corporate bank accounts, money that should be invested. The OECD thinks that as a minimum, a developed country like Britain should be spending 3.5% of GDP on infrastructure. Labour in power will meet and exceed that commitment, reversing decades of underspend. This should include renewable energy, energy efficiency, major public transport improvements and ultra-high-speed broadband. Labour understands that the government's role is to provide the opportunity for massive advances in technology, skills and organisational change. Unless we change our political choices, the vast majority will be denied the opportunities that technological change presents. A new economy where technology liberates rather than traps where the fruits of scientific advance are shared by all, and where every one of us has the opportunity to develop our talents. A prosperous society built on sustainable growth and predicated on the values of fairness, equality, and social justice. It's what I call socialism, but it's socialism with an iPad. Thank you very much.